Hello, everyone. Hello and welcome. My name is Miriam Kadosh, and welcome to the Melanoma Research Foundation's Ask the Expert series. Again, my name is Miriam. I'm the Education and pa Director of Education and Patient Engagement at the Melanoma Research Foundation. We are pleased to have you join us this evening for this wonderful educational opportunity entitled Emerging New Tool to Monitor Melanoma. The goal today is to educate patients and the community on tumor-informed CT DNA as an option for residual disease detection, treatment response monitoring, and surveillance. Our mission at the MRF is to eradicate melanoma by accelerating research while educating to and advocating for the melanoma community. We know that education is critical for patients to make informed decisions about their care. And we are very grateful to Natera for their generous support of this webinar series and investment in the MRF's mission. A bit of housekeeping before we get started. We encourage you to use the Q&A box to ask questions throughout the session today. The information presented during today's session is for educational purposes, and any individual treatment questions should be directed to your healthcare provider. We encourage everyone to visit melanoma.org to learn more about the resources that we have available. And uh, tonight, this session will be available for viewing later as part of our videos on demand library that you can share and rewatch with others. Okay, so tonight we are joined by Dr. Alan Tan. Dr. Alan Tan is director of the Genitourinary Oncology Program at Rush University Medical Center and co-leads the Precision Medicine Program. He is co-chair of the Hoosier Cancer Research Network Melanoma Working Group. He also serves as the Genitourinary Executive Officer for the Alliance for Clinical Trials in Oncology. His research interests include biomarker development for melanoma and genitourinary malignancies. Dr. Tan, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much, Miriam. And good evening, everyone. I hope everyone had a great uh, Tuesday and uh, hopefully being well fed now. I'm going to share my screen now so we can take on the presentation. And uh, let's just make sure, uh, are we seeing the- Yep, all good. Great, okay. So uh, as Marianne mentioned, I, I am also a genital urinary oncologist, but also a melanoma uh, physician. And uh, some of you may wonder well, why specialize in both of that? that that's kind of weird and different. But the reality is uh, back when I was in training and back in the late 90s, 80s, I'd say, late 80s and 90s, uh, the treatment for melanoma involved some types of immunotherapies that we're not really using anymore today. Um, something called interferon, something called interleukin-2. Some of you may, uh, if you've been around long enough or a survivor long enough, uh, I think you may uh, have ex had experience with these traditional treatments that um, were very different, but still in the class of immunotherapy. And of course, in modern day, uh, we now have some of these newer immunotherapies that can be done in an outpatient setting and um, yeah, really improving the benefits and survival in patients with advanced melanoma. But genital urinary cancer, such as kidney cancer, uh, a lot of times I, I call it the, the poster co-poster children of immunotherapy because they both used interleukin-2 and interferon at some point. Um, and so it turned out the treating physicians that uh, were using these, these type of drugs ten, tended to specialize in both melanoma and also kidney cancer. So um, we're gonna talk today about the future role of ctDNA in melanoma. And I wanted to start with a case that I saw relatively recently earlier this year. Uh, I think it really highlights the what we're doing in precision oncology, not just in melanoma, but in, in all of oncology. We're using some of these tools that we have at our disposal 
to really get patient diagnosed better, more efficiently. And so this is a 56 year old gentleman that came to see me across the border here in Northwest Indiana. And uh, he actually was referred first to a hematologist and hematologists specialize in lymphoma, leukemia, those kind of blood cancers. So they thought he had a lymphoma at first, but then when they did a biopsy of the, the tumor, they thought, well, this is not lymphoma. This is something else. But we're really not sure yet, um, but it could be a testicular cancer. So that's why it actually was referred to me. And incidentally, they thought the patient had testicular cancer. And I thought, okay, well, I usually see patients with testicular cancer at a younger age, maybe in their 20s or even 30s, but 56 year old um, is maybe kind of in the older age group for testicular cancer, but not impossible. And so he also, you know, was having some rectal pain, et cetera. And um, I referred him to a urologist and we did an ultrasound of his testicles and it was completely normal. So uh, we thought, I don't, this probably is not testicular cancer. We should really try to find out what, what it is. And in the meantime, he has cancer in multiple places in the body. And instead of just sending him home and saying, okay, we'll, we'll work on this outpatient. And I, I think some of you may have experience with outpatient setting. Sometimes just things just don't happen quite as quickly as we wanted them to. So sometimes we can uh, expedite the workup if we admit the patient to the hospital. And so that's what I did. I advocated for getting things done more quickly. And we have a lot of our consulting services in the hospital. And one of the things we were able to do is do a scan. This is called a PET scan. PET scans, of course, can't be done in the hospital, but it has to be done in outpatient setting. But it's showing you here uh, his, his initial staging. PET scan, if I can, oops. Supposed to be in, there we go. So this is scrolling through um, the frontal view of his, he's got liver metastasis. He's got all of these lymph nodes all over his abdomen and kind of pushing on his uh, rectum there. So wide, widespread disease and seem quite aggressive. And because we can't do a biopsy uh, in the outpatient setting, I sent him for a liquid test. Uh, we call it a liquid biopsy. And with if the tumor is shedding DNA into the bloodstream, we're not able to find mutations um, from a patient's tumor uh, with good accuracy. So this actually came back about seven days after I sent it out, which was really nice and convenient. Um, and it came back with something called a BRF mutation. And specifically, it was a BRF V600E mutation. And so I, I called them up really excited and saying, well, I think, you know, your cancer might be a melanoma and I, I might have good treatment options for you. In melanoma, we now have uh, immunotherapy combinations. We now have targeted therapy. So this patient actually has a uh, good option in a pill form with a couple of pills. Um, there's three now FDA approved BRAF and MEK inhibitors approved for if you have this mutation. And this is actually found in 40% of melanomas. So at least he had that good option. But I also looked down here and I saw something called CD274 and, and also says PDL1 in parentheses. What does that mean? Well, in my experience, this is a marker for higher likelihood to benefit from immunotherapy. So in my opinion, I thought it would be better to start with immunotherapy because we now know from the clinical trials and longer term follow-up with these combination that we can cure almost about half of patients with metastatic melanoma, just like this one with immunotherapy alone. But we don't think we can cure people with these targeted uh, inhibitors like the BRAF inhibitors. And so these patients would have to be on pills forever until they stopped working. But if they had uh, benefited from immunotherapy, they could eventually stop one day, but nobody really understands when to stop. So 
we're going to be talking about CTDNA monitoring today, and this is called the Signatera test, which I'm using in in multiple tumor types. Um, it's been validated first in colorectal cancer to to see if somebody might need or benefit from chemotherapy to prevent their cancer from coming back. But I decided to do it on this patient um, just to see uh, how much it shed. And so this is actually a very high number. February 21st, we drew his uh, lab and it was at 4,700. And um, we gave him cycle of the combination of immunotherapy called Optivo and Uruboy or Ipi and Volumab, we call it. Ipi Niva, we call it. And as you can see, just after one cycle, we start seeing, even though this this uh, the, the the shape of this line is not that significant looking, but just look, forty seven hundred to forty two hundred. That is that is a lot of cell free DNA that is decreasing, uh, but it's just such, he started with such a high number. But this is one cycle of immunotherapy, and immunotherapy does take time to work too. We uh, we don't want to give up on immunotherapy um, too early because it takes time for the immunotherapy to engage and activate the T cells of our immune system. And so now we wait a little bit longer and we have April 5th, such a huge decline from 4,700 to 150. And this is after two cycles of this combination. And overall, he's tolerating it quite well. And his symptoms, such as the rectal pain and the appetite, have gotten a lot better. His quality of life is significantly improved. And then, after the third cycle of this combination, he's complaining about shortness of breath. But then also, we see him in the clinic, and um, we, we get some blood work. And his liver function tests, as you can see, here are abnormal. The, 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 all the red high numbers at the bottom, those are the liver enzymes. We call that AST, ALT. You can see that even got up to the 1,600 was the high. So this is something where if you have these severe side effects with immunotherapy, you have to stop it because it could be dangerous, life-threatening. You have to get in high-dose steroids right away. So we usually dose people with something called prednisone, at one milligram per kilogram. And yeah, he's a bigger guy. So I think he got about 120 milligrams of prednisone. Um, but what else happened? Why was he short of breath? You can see on the right side, he developed uh, a condition called pneumonitis, where the T cells of the immune system decided to attack his lungs. And this one can be pretty, pretty bad. This could, this could kill somebody if untreated, right? Um, we now know more and more about pneumonitis. And so we know that we need to educate people about it. We need to recognize it early and we get to get those, those steroids in right away. Uh, especially in this era where, you know, COVID is uh, still around and even though it doesn't seem like it's around, it's, it's still around. In fact, when he was diagnosed, this could have been mistaken for a COVID pneumonia too. Um, so uh, it's very important for you to tell the emergency room doctors that you're on this treatment that really literally can do almost anything. It's very unpredictable, but we know that um, for the most part, these treatments are well tolerated, but once in a while they can cause these severe side effects. But we think high risk, high reward, right? Look at what happened uh, April 26, down to 8.57. And finally, the most recent one cleared 0.00. .00. So now I'm feeling really good about his disease control of his melanoma. And so we weren't able to tolerate a full, full four courses of this ipinevo drug. We were able to do three. And perhaps he, he's not able to get back on immunotherapy anymore because of this. But we did decide to get another PET scan to see what we're dealing with. And so now here we have the follow-up PET CT. And as you can see here, liver lesions are gone and everything that was there before is gone. The only things that are lighting up are things that are supposed to light up functionally, like the kidneys. This is how you get rid of what you injected, the uh, the, the PET material, and also the, the heart is pumping. So that uses up glucose as well. 
So this is essentially a negative PET CT. He had a complete response to for, to immunotherapy, but is he done there? You know, I, I think uh, that's the question we don't understand. You know, is four three cycles and one one dose of nivolumab Optivo enough to cure such an aggressive melanoma? I decided that you know let's not take our chances since he does have that BRAF mutation. We'll see if he can tolerate those pills and complete a year of treatment. But I have a, a gut feeling that he may be okay long term and the cancer is not coming back. And so we know from the clinical trial that got this drug approved that survival is quite good. This is called the Kaplan Meyer curve for overall survival on this x axis here, the y axis here. This is overall survival. If you if you looked at a survival curve back. Uh, 15, 20 years ago, it would look like like this because median survival for metastatic melanoma was like six months, right? So at six months, half of patients would unfortunately not be alive anymore. And then there'd be some people that, that were still alive for longer, but for the most part, most patients would succumb to the illness. But look how far we've come now. In 2011, we got the FDA approval of Eurovoy, and we call this the tail of the curve. We like to see this because uh, this means that people are living a long time and probably cured. Once you have flat line here, that means it's going to continue from a melanoma standpoint, it's going to continue pretty much indefinitely, even if we follow this up at 10 years, 15 years. And then what happens with Optio by itself? You get 42% survival at now seven and a half years. And if you get both of them combination, about half of people are alive and well and probably disease free at seven and a half years. So we've really come a long way. So we're gonna talk about the utility of using ctDNA melanoma. Um, I think it's really important too to assess if a patient's benefiting from the immunotherapy or any type of treatment you're giving a patient. As you see, we saw it going down pretty quickly. And so we knew to keep going if the patient was tolerating it. Sometimes it might go up first um, and then go down. I think within that first three to four months, uh, you really need to activate the immune system for that to happen. But if you're on chemotherapy per se, we don't use chemotherapy in melanoma, or if you're on target therapy, we expect it to go down right away. We don't expect an up and then down. So. So that's something more unique to immunotherapy. Using ctDNA to de-escalate therapy is also possible as well. So if somebody has a, let's just say this patient didn't have all that toxicity, but he still had a negative PET scan after like three or four months, I consider that an exceptional response. And you know the, the guidance is we should treat people, we can treat people for up to two years uh, for metastatic melanoma with immunotherapy. But should we? My opinion is maybe not, especially if you if you clear your disease that quickly, I would try to run more to the first year and stop at one year instead of doing the full two years because who knows what's gonna happen. You could get yourself into trouble with side effects that are life altering. Um, and so that's, it's just also inconvenient, right? I mean, even though these drugs are, uh, shorter infusions than chemo, I think uh, patients want to stay away from the cancer center if possible. I think uh, there's an anxiety component and also scanxiety, right? That's another thing about the ctDNA. When you monitor these things uh, over time, I think it relieves patients and caregivers and also myself that the scans are going to look okay. We have uh, CT DNA kinetics that is pointing down and clearing. I don't really uh, expect to see anything suspicious on the skin. Sometimes we can escalate patients uh, that you know had surgery, and we just, like, we were kind of on the fence: should they get treatment or should they not? Well, if if we have positivity, we can detect the DNA still. It's probably coming back. So we should probably do some treatment to make that risk go away. And so that's a, a way we can escalate therapy. And then finally, surveillance for occurrence. Say maybe somebody had surgery for stage one melanoma and 
you're not supposed to do any immunotherapy after that. But you can, you know, get a radar. Sometimes patients ask me, how does my blood work? Look, and I say, well, it looks fine, but that doesn't mean that your melanoma is not back. Uh, just typical blood counts and chemistries are not going to tell us anything about if melanoma is back. It's going to be scans, clinical picture, like if you're having any headaches, concern for brain metastasis. But now we have a tool that we can do uh, at the comfort of your home, home, in fact, they actually have set up mobile phlebotomy that where they can come to your house however often uh, we ask them to. Usually I, I pick every 12 weeks. And so uh, usually I'm, I'm on the portal trying to look for recurrences. And if I see a zero turn to a two, I will make sure I get that patient in very quickly. Okay, so what is this? TNM staging system for cancer has been around for a while. We usually talk about tumor size, lymph nodes, and metastasis. We call that the TNM staging system. I argue we should call it TNMD. Maybe in the future, we could also stage people based on their CT DNA or circulating tumor DNA. I think that's going to be uh, even more relevant than some of these other things that we're currently looking at. What is CT DNA? Well, let's first talk about what cell-free DNA is. We have a lot of uh, circulating DNA um, that's from breakdown of different cells in our body, whether it's bacteria, viruses, healthy blood cells, et cetera. So it's just, you know, things are just floating around. You have cell turnover, even healthy cells, they release cell-free DNA. But CT DNA is circulating tumor DNA from dying cancer cells. And they release this uh, when they die, uh, when they get treated, maybe if you get radiation, CT DNA could flare up too. Uh, so this is something that's more specific. We're also able to detect this uh, in urine nowadays as well. So I, I test this for bladder cancer. But the interesting thing about cell-free DNA is the half-life is less than two hours. So it really allows us to monitor these patients in real time. And if it's positive, we actually think it's there. So we talked about how we can apply this to uh, everyday practice, not just for melanoma, but like we're, we're focused on melanoma now. There's some that are looking into this for early cancer detection, right? And uh, uh, that's up and coming. But in our area, we're looking at it to look for disease recurrence or after surgery, looking for residual disease. Maybe we're trying to see how well our treatments are working, like I just showed you. And sometimes we could actually monitor, like if, if it recurs, is it mutating into something else too? So, um, and there's two different types of these types of tests. I won't get into too much detail, but the one that I use most is the Signatera and that's a tumor informed. So you require a tissue biopsy. So in melanoma, your, your doctor, either dermatologist or surgical oncologist would have removed uh, some of your tumor Maybe it's in your lymph nodes. They would have got some uh, from that specimen as well. Uh, if it's metastatic melanoma, we probably have a lot more uh, tissue to work with. But this is a personalized assay, so it takes time. It may take four to six weeks to, to get that first time point. But once you get the first time point, the subsequent ones come back anywhere from seven to 10 days in my experience, Okay. There's also tumor naive ones that that are um, emerging, but I say the downside of those is they they might not be as specific. They might pick up some background noise. So a little bit more about the Signatera assay. Basically, uh, you're taking the tumor from the melanoma, let's say, and we're doing something called whole exome sequencing. Uh, another word similar to that is next generation sequencing. So if you ever had something like a Tempest or a Foundation One or Keras, those are the most popular ones. It's very similar to that. So you have to do sequencing of the, the cancer, but Natera is seeking out 16 specific mutations for your cancer alone. And so that kind of eliminates a lot of the chance for any false positives, okay? And so, um, if any two mutations of those 16 are floating around in the bloodstream at any time, you'll get a positive result. So that's how accurate it is. So 
In stage two, three melanoma, this is kind of the area where sometimes, you know, we have drugs approved, but we don't know, should we give it to everyone? And so these are the, the trials that have showed that giving immunotherapy for a year or target therapy for a year, it has been shown to be beneficial. But we also know that a lot of these patients are already cured by surgery alone. We just don't know, we're not, just not smart enough to know who's been cured already with surgery and who's gonna come uh, have recurrence. And so what we have is this uh, uh, survival and we correlate it with what stage people are. As you can see, stage one, stage one B, 99%, 97% melanoma specific survival uh, probability at five years. So that's pretty good. But I will argue, what about that 3% or that 1% here? Are they important too? So if we monitor 100 patients, maybe we'll still find a few. And we have found some in stage one as well. In fact, I found a patient that recurred with stage zero melanoma, and he had widely metastatic disease. So if he had some tests like this, he could have picked it up. Uh, stage 2A, 2B, quite a difference here in uh, survival, but 2C is even worse here. Right, we just got FDA approvals for Keytruda not too long ago for this population, but we're we're, we're helping these patients uh, live longer, or sorry, not live longer, but have melanoma recurrence, uh, uh, less melanoma recurrences with this treatment. But we also think we're also over treating the majority of patients. So, so what gives? As you can see here in stage three, the numbers are are worse. So we think these people should definitely get immunotherapy. These people here, you, you can you can give or take, you can talk with your doctor and say, well, you know, maybe, maybe we should get a biomarker like a signatura to see uh, if I really truly need it. All right, so, and here's a case of a stage two melanoma of mine that we did the surveillance. And at the first time point, he was negative. And then, just a couple months later, he becomes positive. I say, hey, uh, I'm not sure what to do here because your, your DNA is positive and your scans are negative, but let's just do another one. Sure enough, it goes up higher. So this is confirmatory that if it's going up like this, one eventually it's going to keep going up until you see it on a scan. So that's what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid it going from stage 2A to stage 4, right? So... And this is called molecular recurrence. And so stage 2A does not have any FDA approved drugs. So I had to do a peer-to-peer -peer review um, with another physician. And I had to uh, literally plead my case that he deserves immunotherapy and that he, he was nice and did approve it. And one dose of Keytruda and look at that, cleared ctDNA and now has cleared it completely you know, he's scared of it recurring, but I actually told him recently he could stop um, less, than, less than a year into it. So, and he tolerated well. Here's another patient that, similar scenario, he had a higher risk, stage 2C melanoma, and he actually was hard to convince. He was one of those people that was a successful businessman, but you explained to him the, the data. And I think also... A lot of times patients are blindsided by the staging. Stage two doesn't sound as scary as stage three, right? And we can discuss that later. Um, but uh, stage two C is actually just as risky as stage three B. It's just that, you know, it's it's kind of a flaw in the staging system, if you ask me. But he decided, I'm good. I don't think I want it. Um, but he allowed me to do this test on him. So in fact... He actually stopped seeing me, but he kept doing these mobile phlebotomy tests. And, you know, I didn't think, I didn't think he was ever going to come back to see me. Just because he just didn't believe in needing treatment. But then uh, this is now um, September of 2022. So first, first one was December, uh, right after Christmas. And then the one where he was positive was September 16th. So quite, quite a while since... We, we had the discussion that it turned positive. It was pretty pretty highly positive. 1.55 is significant in my opinion. 
his scans were still negative, but now he agrees to do the Keytruda. And so he gets on that, once again, clears his CTDNA and has remained clear ever since. And I actually gave him an easy uh, or an early out as well. I don't think he needed a full year of treatment. So we published a paper. I, I followed 51 patients using this method. And I just published it recently at uh, the ASCO meeting uh, in, in June in Chicago. This is very confusing to look at, but let me just summarize. Right here is the cutoff from stage two and stage three. The black dots are people that have DNA positivity. So as you can see, stage two, it's, you know, some of these patients uh, are negative right after surgery, but then later, six months later, even 12 months later, much later, then they become positive. So in my opinion, you know, it doesn't matter um, if we catch it right after surgery or if we catch it, you know, six months later, 12 months later, if we collect, uh, if we detect it at a molecular level before it shows up on scans, just based on my sample size, we have a great success rate of clearing that ctDNA uh, with just either one drug or at most two drugs. So, um, if, of course, in stage three, is is higher risk. So you can see the black dots come sooner than in stage two. So it's a really interesting thing that we found, and we're continuing to collect this. But overall, when we, when we looked at that, we found detectable ctDNA in over 30% of patients. And um, these patients found it really helpful and no patient died of uh, the, the, the Signatera, you know, missing uh, the surveillance, right? Only one patient had lung metastasis uh, and it was not detected by the Signatera. And in fairness, it was a small lung nodule then and that test was not able to form a full 16 gene complement. So I think that's uh, why it wasn't detectable there. So I, I have pretty high confidence in the majority of patients here. It says 94% of patients were persistently negative and remained clinically and radiographically progression-free. So this led me to design my own clinical trial that I'm opening up soon. I'm looking at patients with stage two and three melanoma, and I'm using the signature test to help guide whether people need it or not. And maybe if you're negative at first, you keep doing the test. And if you convert to positive later on, you'll get six months, not a year, six months of a combination of a new uh, drug called semiplumab plus fianlimab. This is a new mechanism uh, that is a uh, lag three inhibitor. All right, so we're winding up here, and, and then we can have a discussion here. Here's another interesting case. You know, in oncology, I think a lot of people would think we're crazy if we treated a 92, 93-year-old um, for cancer. Um, but we always use the case example of Jimmy Carter. He was 93, 92 when he was diagnosed. And so this is a very similar case. Uh, he had metastatic melanoma to his left armpit. It's, you can feel it as a golf ball size. And it was on its way to traveling to other areas. So I thought, how can we help this guy not die from melanoma and treat him with a bare minimum? And so we decided to, you know, do a signature. Surprisingly, he was negative at first, but then later on, he became positive. And as I started him on the every three-week dose of the signatura, sorry, of the Keytruda, his ctDNA kinetics started to go up. So at first I was thinking it's not working. Maybe I need to switch um, to something else, but we really didn't have too much because uh, he didn't have a BRAP mutation. So I just continued with the treatment because I scanned him and the scan actually looked better. And eventually the, the DNA kinetics caught up to him. And eventually, as you can see here, this is like three months later, he now goes down to zero, um, becomes positive again transiently, but then clears. And now I stopped his treatment at um, six cycles, which is pretty much four months of treatment. Most people would have treated for a whole year, but I said, 
This is a 93-year-old guy. He turned 93, very frail. He drives himself to the clinic. He falls a lot, and he fell a couple of times getting to our clinic. And I thought that was just horrible. I I didn't want him to um, risk driving the clinic and getting to an accident, et cetera. So I said, as soon as I saw that he cleared his CT DNA, I said, sir, you're done with me. Let's just follow up by telephone in the future. So, and then the, the Signatura lab comes to him and gets a couple of tubes of blood from him every, uh, every 12 months or 12 weeks. I mean, let's finish with another final unique case. This is a patient of mine that she's 30 years old. She had melanoma while she was in her third trimester of pregnancy. And she, um, you know, she delivered successfully and we couldn't give her any treatment um, or do any like imaging on her until after she delivered. So she finally delivers and, you know, she's stage 2C and I had recommended Keytruda for her, but she had chose to not do it because she wanted to breastfeed. And so I thought, well, that's reasonable. Let's closely monitor your Signatera tests. And it was negative for a good while, three consecutive times. And then I see her earlier this year and she's still doing good. She doesn't tell me much detail, but uh, we had told her not to get pregnant again. Uh, but she didn't offer any any type of uh, further information. So then I get an April 5th result that became positive, 1.44. And I thought, oh boy. And then she said, um, I call her and I said, hey, there's a positivity in your signature. I'm, I'm sorry to tell you. And then she said, hey, I wanted to let you know that I'm expecting. I'm about eight weeks along and I'm due November 6th. We're very excited, but definitely want to stay on top of everything on the melanoma end. Please let me know if there's anything I should do and the next signature sample should be done soon. And so this was it. So I had the tough task of telling her that, you know, maybe it's best to not have this baby. And it's hard for me to say, because I have, I have a five-year-old and I have a 19 month old and, you know, I can't imagine life without them. But um, we talked about it and she decided that she wanted to keep the baby and, you know, um, we, you know, at this point we can't do any scans, uh, no PET scans, no, uh, CT scans because of the radiation arm. So we did full body MRI, um, which is very cumbersome and expensive, but that's all we had could do. And we did it without contrast too. So we can't see everything, but we probably saw something in her liver and her lungs. But as, as time goes by, she, she has higher and higher CT DNA. And, you know, I really don't know what's going on except that she looks really good. And her DNA levels most recently have skyrocketed to 1200. And so really praying for her, um, but she's going to deliver very soon. I think uh, next month in October, which is uh, between her OBGYN uh, and I, we said that's, that's the earliest she could deliver where um, the baby would be safe and she would be the safest. And so that's what we're going to do. And uh, hopefully by the time she delivers, we get a, a PET scan and a MRI of the brain as soon as possible. And we get her started on uh, immunotherapy, active and your voice, my plan. So, so that's, that's one of the more challenging case, but at least we're not blindsided uh, because we're able to at least detect this non-invasive CT DNA um, and the molecular level of this. So, so I'll close with that. I think we start, stop right in time so we can, have questions. Thank you, Dr. Tan, for explaining this and for giving us some case examples here to understand how this tool has helped you as you have treated patients. And it sounds like you have had more information than you've ever had before using this tool. Right, it's a, it's a really hot topic. It, not just in melanoma, but in genital urinary cancer that I treat, lung cancer, every, any conference you go to, CT DNA is the buzzword. The buzzword. But, uh, yeah. yeah. How many centers 
Uh, well, there's a question here, but I was going to add on to it. Um, was how do you get your oncologist to do CT DNA? Well, that's a, that's a great question. And, you know, some, some oncologists don't have any experience with it uh, or maybe very little experience, but you can ask your oncologist um, if they've heard of Signatera or know how to order that. And um, there's a decent chance that they may not understand how to order it or the logistics behind it. But I think uh, they they can be connected. And I, I don't know if anybody from Natura is on this webinar, but I think we could probably connect you to your local representative uh, that can help uh, get you to that person and explain to that person how you can order it. Yeah, I'll make sure to put my email in the chat. So if anyone mm -hmm. has any additional questions on how to get connected, um, I'd be happy to help support you. Um, okay, so a few questions here. So I hope it's okay that I'll go through them. Mm -hmm. um, are your patients cutaneous or also mucosal and or subcutaneous? Yes, great question. I, you know, I, I didn't want to go over time, but I did have a recent mucosal melanoma patient too that, uh, you know, I thought with mucosal melanoma, we didn't really have good adjuvant options. So it was, it was, uh, I tried to get him on a clinical trial and he missed his window to get on it. But I said, okay, well, your scans are negative right now, but this is definitely high risk. It was a sinonasal mucosal melanoma. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I got his signature back and it came back at 50. And I thought, oh boy, we need to get a PET scan now. And we did get a PET scan and Monday. And unfortunately he has uh, multiple liver metastasis and a bone metastasis. But we do know that the, the Checkmate 067 data shows that there is a 43% chance of success uh, with this combination. So yeah. he's gonna uh, saddle up and go through the immunotherapy mm -hmm. and hope, hope to God that he has a great response too. And we will be monitoring that CTDNA kinetics and see how good we can do, if we can clear that. So the CTDNA, just to clarify, only gives you a number. It doesn't tell you where the metastases right. could have potentially gone to. It just kind of gives you a number that says it's still there. Or it's yeah, so, so it gives you uh, a heads up that you better look for it <laughs> because it's there. Yeah, It could be hiding. You may decide if a CT scan is negative, you could do a PET scan. You know, I'm not saying PET scan is better than CT in all cases, but sometimes a negative CT um, might reflex you to a PET CT. Have you ever had a situation where you couldn't find where it was and you were yeah. getting them higher numbers? Right, so... So a good case was in a rare type of uh, bladder cancer, small cell bladder cancer. Mm -hmm. And his number kept going up and up and up, but his scans kept um, coming back negative. And maybe, you know, it depends on the radiologist that looks at it. You know, it, sometimes in black and white, it can look like just a whole bunch of fuzz. But if you got a PET, so we eventually got a PET scan when the, the number was actually higher and it actually was found in his lungs. So... Uh, we were able to start treatment then. Right. Is CTDNA something that could be used now for someone who was stage 3A 15 years ago at diagnosis, but has not had a recurrence mm -hmm. aside from a basal yeah. or squamous cell? Well, first I would say if you're stage three, if you were stage three 15 years ago, there's a high likelihood you're cured. The, the 10 year survival is like 93%. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. You know, the last thing we want to do is have people do a test to bring them more anxiety. I think mm -hmm. 15 years out, you're probably good. But could it be done if you really, really wanted to? It all depends on if um, the place that you had the biopsy or the surgery done still kept your specimen and it's frozen somewhere you know, you, you can still try it. Uh, stage three A's are not very thick, so they oftentimes lack uh, enough tissue as well. So my guess is it, it's probably not feasible. Yeah, and, and your point on scanxiety, you have found that this has actually 
um, been less anxiety producing because patients know that they have scans coming up or tests coming up um, more frequently than scans? Or would you say this causes more anxiety? Where do you kind of yeah. find your patients on that level? I there? see, I see most patients wanting this because it gives them peace of mind, you know, that, that, well, I, if they can't even detect it at a DNA level, then how are they going to detect it at a macroscopic level, right? Mm -hmm. If you're, if you're seeing one nodule on a uh, CT scan in the lungs per se, mm -hmm. that's, that's like a million, at least a million cancer cells to make that up. Right. We're detecting cell-free DNA um, at a certain level. And I don't think it would ever, if they designed it correctly with the 16 gene complement, I don't think you could ever miss it if it got to pass a certain threshold. I don't think the sensitivity is going to be a hundred percent, but as I right. showed you in the stage two to three, that once it gets past a certain threshold, eventually it'll become positive. Like those stage twos, they became positive at six months, mm -hmm. nine months, 12 months. And that means to me that it was always there, but the scans couldn't see it and mm -hmm. no, no other blood test could see it. And even the Signatura didn't see it until it became to that level, until it grew to that level. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty exciting that you can detect it so much earlier than we were before mm -hmm. using this test. So mm -hmm. um, another question was, will it work for bladder and kidney cancer? And you kind of answered that mm -hmm. before. Yeah. So bladder cancer is very exciting. That's, you know, one of my research interests and we're using it to, we, we already have a lot of data that tells us if you're positive, you know, before your chemotherapy, you know, and you clear the DNA, you're better off. But especially if you're positive after you have a radical cystectomy, uh, mm -hmm. that's a bad thing. You probably um, need Optivo, which is the immunotherapy that's approved for adjuvant mm -hmm. bladder cancer. Kidney cancer is a different story. I wouldn't put, um, you know, it's all about how much DNA the tumor sheds. So melanoma, lung cancer, colon cancer, um, these shed DNA well. Um, but kidney cancer is on that other side of the spectrum that doesn't shed very well. So you probably have to have uh, stage four disease uh, to really have it become positive. I mean, there are exactly. some stage yeah. threes that I wouldn't use it in the adjuvant setting right now to decide mm -hmm. whether or not to get Keytruda for adjuvant therapy for kidney cancer. But I do have a lot of samples from kidney cancer and um, looking at the kinetics really is helpful. We have metastatic stage four kidney cancer patients and we have different options for kidney cancer like Optivo Yervoy. And if it's not working, if it keeps going up, I may switch them to something like Optivo plus Cabozantinib just to make it go down. So from that standpoint, I think that's where it's the most helpful in kidney cancer. Is there um, any place for ctDNA for patients who are stage four malignant melanoma and NED for several years? Um, well, depends on what you mean by several years. If it's a few years, then I'd say, yeah, sure. If it's, you know, like the other patient said, 15 years, uh, I don't think that's a good place to use it. I yeah. think, yeah, I think it's it's good. Of course, you know, if you could go back in time and do it from the beginning and prove that you were already positive and you cleared it, that's the most powerful data to me. But mm -hmm. also, um, you know, having a 0, 0.00 result regardless is also reassuring in my opinion, as long as they were able to design it well. So when do you typically start this tool using this tool at, at first diagnosis or? Yeah. As soon as the patient gets referred to me either by okay. the surgeon or not, like sometimes we don't see these patients until after they had their surgery. Um, mm -hmm. So now, now I have our surgical oncologist on board. She's testing the stage ones and the stage two up to two A and I'm stage, I'm testing the two beats to the threes and fours. And so um, sometimes she's sending them out even before the surgery. So um, it's interesting to see that, you know, I'll see somebody's result and I'll send it to her. I was like, hey, 
I, I don't know this patient, but it looks mm -hmm. concerning to me. It's positive. It's like, oh, yes, I'm about to do surgery on her uh, next week. So we'll see what it what the surgery does to that mm -hmm. patient. Yeah, very fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Dr. Tan, you discussed stages two and three studies. Do you have any data for stage four patients? What is the difference between mm -hmm. stage three and stage four? Uh, well, stage four is is something that today we should treat with two immunotherapies or two targeted therapies. I favor immunotherapy like Optivo-Yervoy or maybe the, the newer one called Abdulag, which is Optivo plus Rolatlamib. It's thought to be a safer combination. So safe, stage four, we know we could cure these patients too with combination immunotherapy. In stage two and stage three, I think the, the, the controversy is, well, do all these patients need these therapies? Um, are we over treating these patients? Mm -hmm. Because we don't, we don't see an overall survival benefit yet. The reason why we're not seeing an overall survival benefit yet in the stage two and stage three is because we have these Optivo Yervois as a backup. So even if they came back as metastatic melanoma uh, after watching closely, we could cure them later as well too. But of course, that's going to be more anxiety provoking for patients too, mm -hmm. and and having more toxic drugs. Optivo Yervoy is is far more toxic than doing you know one drug of Keytruda or Optivo. How widespread would you say this tool is being used for melanoma? I'm probably one of only you know, two handfuls of people using it regularly around the country, I'd say. Um, so it's not used, being used very often for melanoma right now. Um, I think there's people using it sporadically. The, the, the Natura folks kind of have uh, a better understanding about where it's used, being used the most, but probably mostly at academic centers. I'm using it to help my patients, but also to collect data to publish mm -hmm. research so that we can learn more about this, right? Uh, but I would say this test is using being used as standard of care more so in, um, sorry, in uh, colon cancer right now and also in um, bladder cancer because that's where we have the most data in. I'm seeing a few questions that people are putting in that are quite specific to their case. So I'm actually not gonna read those out loud. If people have additional questions, we do ask that you um, take those questions to your, your care team. Um, a few people are asking some bladder cancer questions. Um, can you see bladder cancer with a PET scan without using a catheter? Seems un- um, Can you see bladder cancer without using, I'm, I'm wondering what you mean by catheter. Um, yeah, I'm not like a, sure. So I, I do order PET scans for uh, bladder cancer, uh, only if the CT scan is not that, um, you know, sensitive and I have high risk disease, such as like if lymph nodes are seen at surgery and, you know, I might want to restage them with a, a more specific tool. And that would be the PET scan. Okay, great. Just a comment here, as, a, as I'm reading a stage four melanoma survivor for 10 years now. Thank you for all the research and clinical work you are doing to help cancer patients. Amazing progress has been made over the last several years. So I agree. A, great, a grateful so patient. Yeah. Yeah. As someone, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, like I mentioned in the beginning, like, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it, it was a death sentence. And now I feel so confident uh, coming into a patient's room where they're just terrified and letting them know that you're going to be okay. It's, it's, it's more likely you're going to be okay than not. Mm. That must, that confidence, you probably wouldn't have had 15, 20 years ago. So that's incredible and very hopeful for our patients. Um, as someone, I'm gonna, I think this will be our last question of the night. 
I've been just throwing them out at you here. I appreciate oh, it. I love it. I love it. I can stay on forever <laughs> if I want. <laughs> P- people are are very interested, which is wonderful. So as someone who received, okay, I'm getting a few more. As someone who received immunotherapy for metastatic melanoma and is now being monitored for recurrence with regular CT scans at increasing intervals, how do you advocate advocate for use of this tool in the interim for peace of mind? Any tips? Oh yeah, so that's that's a great question. So did, did you say increasing or decreasing intervals of PET scan? Increasing. Yeah, increasing. so this this would actually decrease my intervals. So um, if I have been following the signature for uh, a long time and it went from positive to negative, I don't do every three month scans anymore. I go every four after the, you know, after, you know, sometimes I'll go every six months. Eventually mm-hmm. I'll go once to once a year, usually at, at uh, you know, years three, four, and five. And then after year five, I, I consider it optional. Um, if a patient really wants to have that yearly scan, they can. Um, but I think having this CT DNA, um, you know, they, they don't tell us when we should stop, right? Like we can go for peace of mind after, you know, mm-hmm. every six months, once a year. Um, I mm-hmm. think, you know, having somebody come to your house and getting two tubes of blood is is really not that inconvenient. Yeah. Of course, in my social work mind is thinking about insurance coverage, but I don't know if you know the answer to that. I I don't know that answer, but I do know that if you're on immunotherapy, uh, it's covered by Medicare. Um, you know, if you're if you're on immunotherapy monitoring, that's approved right now. And the Terra really, um, if you order it, they won't come. Um, you know, they don't have a collections agency, so they won't come for the patient. They won't balance bill the patient. I think they're interested in giving people that are interested in using the test the experience, and eventually they know that one day they will get approval throughout um, all insurance payers and and they are probably setting up for that one day. Absolutely. That would be wonderful. Great. Well, I believe um, we are closing up on our evening today. I really appreciate the conversation, um, your candidness, your hopefulness in sharing your cases with us and the work you've done. Um, And thank you for presenting today. My pleasure. Uh, Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks again to Natera for their generous support of our Ask the Expert webinar series. Um, And again, this program will be available on demand on our learning platform. So look out for that. Also streamed on social media channels at a later day. Um, At the end of the program this evening, in just a few moments, um, when you click exit or end from the Zoom session, an evaluation will pop up. And we ask that you please do fill that out and provide us with any feedback on today's session. Your feedback is so very important so that we can provide programs just like this to you in the future. Uh, Please visit us at melanoma.org to learn more about our upcoming webinars and other educational or advocacy programs and opportunities. And if you have any additional questions for me, you can reach me at education at at melanoma.org. I'll say that again, education at melanoma.org. And with that, have a good evening, a good Labor Day weekend that is coming up. And thank you so much for joining us.